In your own words, can you describe the furry fandom? Oh, man. Oh, God. Well, um... <laughs> what is this? What, what is this whole world? My sister met a furry at school. I saw this furry and they're so gross. And I was like, what's that, that furry? Oh. Hmm. Um, just through the power of the internet, I discovered furries. So I went to Google and looked it up. Google, Google and just finding images from various keywords. I'm not a furry. <laughs> <laughs> A furry is a fan of anthropomorphic characters. Furries often have an animal representation of themselves. This is called a fursona. Actually, I'd say that at the beginning, I was more like, why do I enjoy these weird costumes? Why do I find this suit really nice? Why do I this? Because it's a pretty unconventional hobby. I ended up going to a free con in 2016. And I went with some friends. And honestly, I didn't really enjoy my experience that much. But I did get to try one fursuit on. It was way too small for me because I'm a pretty big guy. But I got to try it on and I was like, this is really, really cool. So I ended up ordering one, going to the same convention the next year. And I had the most fun I've had in like a super long time. And that was like the catalyst to the whole thing. For me personally, when I created my persona, I, I made it somebody who I wanted to be and eventually I turned into that, but also it turned into me. This idea of a Zootopia-like world where everyone's an animal and then their species brings out more of their character. I've always liked art and sculptures and animals. And I was just an artist loving Disney and dogs. I've watched almost every Disney movie out there. My favorite one is probably, yeah, probably Robin Hood. You like Zootopia? We really like Zootopia animal related books like Redwall and Warriors. Redwall is like the furry before furry. It is! Star Fox, Star Fox Adventures, that's the one. I've been in the fandom for about 10 years actively. I didn't know there was a fandom until I really got on the internet and found other furries. It's constantly changing because there's always new people coming, going, new ideas. The fandom is basically shaped by the creations of thousands and thousands of people. So I guess the furry fandom to me is just a way to, to describe yourself. As a high school kid, I always wanted to stick out from everybody and then also wondered why they didn't like me. <laughs> and then as I got older, I was like, oh, it's because I'm totally different. Growing up, I wasn't really the most popular person. I had some self-esteem issues. I had communication problems and I was bullied a little bit. I have to be somebody that I'm not to please others. And with furry, being different is the norm. Regardless of like who someone is, we're just will, we're willing to give them that first chance. You can be a dog with a dragon tail if you want. Who cares? You can be a super feminine lizard. Who cares? Like you can do what you want. There's no actual rules. 
You could be totally comfortable being a furry and being yourself. You know, I'm finally free to be the person who I wanted to be, so you know, I'm just real happy about that. I'd have to say that my favorite part of the furry fandom, for sure, is, uh, I threw that pun in there. I get it. For sure. <laughs> You're welcome. Good job. Most definitely, the, the ability to make and find friends just like that. You know, being in the military, you get thrown everywhere at any point in time. I got stationed in South Korea, and I made three furry friends just from some online chat room, and that was my first time fursuiting was in Seoul Tower on South Korea. There are people that you'll find that have a lot of similar interests to you, and there's so many people from a, such diversity of backgrounds in the fandom. Well, I really love traveling. Like, it's just really cool to just go, to go around the country and just, like, go to all these different events and, like, see different people from all sorts of walks of life come together. It helped me to uh, improve myself about the languages, about uh, polit international politics, like, how the people look their own world and their own for community. No one wants to be judged on things they like and want. In the fandom, it's like hardly an issue. If you're a scientist or a doctor, if you work at the gas station or the grocery store, or if you live with your mom, or if you live in a mansion, it's all gone. We're all at the same playing field. It's you who they care about. You know, I met my husband through the furry fandom. I've met all my friends basically through the furry fandom. Now I'm doing it as work. It's a huge part of my life. It's very important to me. The furry fandom has influenced me. It's really made me more confident as a person just because I was interacting with more people. My favorite part about the furry fandom is the community, like no, no questions. The furry fandom was literally like, hey, we're here. You don't have to be alone. And that's something that I've never experienced anywhere. Through time, I started like more accepting that, like, okay, I like weird stuff, I like this, I like that. Going to a lot of cons, meeting new people, having so much fun. In the end, the fandom makes me happy. And that's what really matters to me. I really didn't like the job I was working in. I didn't like the field I was in. I was working as a paralegal. I had been doing art and commissions on the side for years already, and I thought, well, maybe I have a big enough audience now. Let's try and jump into this. I'm done working for other people. I want to do my own thing now. I quit my job. A week later, I opened my first round of commission slots and had overwhelming response to those. It just confirmed I can do this. I can make a living off of this now. I'm going to jump full force into it. And it's been awesome so far. I've always loved mascots and stuff because I love meeting characters at Disneyland, of course. Tigger has always been my favorite from Winnie the Pooh because he's always a really hyper character. My mom's an artist, so I kind of looked up to her. I'd be like, Mom, can you draw Winnie the Pooh? And she'd draw it for me, and I loved it, and so I would also be trying to do that. If you get a fursuit, you're not just buying an item, you're buying a part of you. I was very connected to my very first suit because I was making part of me. 
I glued the foam, I glued the fur. When I put it on, I was like, okay, I have this thing on my head, my hands are covered. It's no longer an item that you made or you put together. It's now officially, I don't want to say a living thing, but it is a living thing at the same time. You have to show people who you are. This is the character, not just you where you're just walking on your own. Sometimes it shows you who it is, or you show it who you are. It's a feeling you can't really describe until you actually just go for it. So you gotta work on it, you know. Discover yourself, stand in front of a mirror, going in the bathroom and putting on the head. You know, I made one, and then I made one for a friend, and then another friend, and it just kind of evolved into a business when I really didn't intend on it. Fast forward 10 years, now I have established Made For You, which is now probably one of the biggest companies people can recognize and a community of furries, and I guess that sums up me as cyber. <laughs> All right, finally, the day is here. When I saw that there are actually people wearing their own characters, like fursuits, and they go to these conventions and all that stuff, and I thought, wow, that's actually pretty cool. When I first joined the fandom and got my suit, I didn't really know a lot of people, so I felt like, oh, it's easy for me to just run around and do whatever I want. When I go to cons, I suit up like 10, 12 hours, it's not the only reason to be in the fandom, but it's my reason to be in the fandom. So, was fursuiting your primary interest getting into the fandom? Mm, no. Mm -hmm. Actually, no. Uh, my main interest was the community. A lot of people I know, they don't want a fursuit. They just enjoy making art, they just enjoy watching content, they just enjoy like many things. But now that I have more friends in this community, when I get in fursuit, it's harder because I can't interact with all of them at once. So I like to take the fursuit off every once in a while and spend some time with my friends, just being ourselves instead of playing a character. I never got into fursuiting until like this year. Like I didn't own one until like my 10th year in this community. I was like, well, everybody has them. Maybe I'm missing out on something, I'll just do it. But it never felt like important to me that I get one. I have the character that I have because, you know, they would be like, why don't you have a fursona? I'd be like, mm -mm. <laughs> because I'm trying my best. But like, it's, it doesn't like, I don't feel like any sort of like spiritual connection to it or just like, this is an important part of who I am. I just, it's, it's, I just have a thing. I've got my processes down. I know exactly what steps I need to do, but I've been making suits for 10 years now. Starting out, I had no idea what I was doing. I hadn't built those techniques yet, so it was just like a lot of experimentation, like how do I make this ear look right? How do I make sure it's symmetrical? How do I make paws? Someone's character is a very, very personal thing to them, and obviously, like, as a suit maker, you have a pressure to get it right. Just trying to figure all that out, and it's not a guaranteed paycheck, and, you know, you've got to pay taxes, and materials are expensive and you gotta buy like health insurance and you still gotta be able to make rent and make all your bills. I gotta open another slot to make bills this month. So it just, it can be stressful. A lot of people, especially my family, didn't really believe in it. They're like, so what is with it? What are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm doing this. And they're like, yeah, but why? And I'm like, I don't know how to explain. I'm just doing this thing that everyone seems to like, and even though they didn't get it, it gave me the life that I don't think I could ever have gotten any other way. There's been a handful I, I finish and I make and I send out and they say thank you, and then I, I hear nothing ever again, which to me is almost like a heartbreak. You know, I just, I just birthed this fursuit and it's gone forever. It's been like three years and I have no clue what it's, what happened to it. But most of the time, I'll always see pictures, they'll update me and be like, oh, I did this thing, I wore it at this event. Or some people do charities, I love it when people do charities. They make YouTube videos or do really cool Twitter pictures that have really cool light dynamics and stuff. 
I've seen people cook meals in their fursuit, and I'm like, that's cool. I could never do that. I want them to know I really appreciate it because it keeps me going knowing that people are enjoying it, they're doing stuff. Because of something I've made with my hands, people recognize me and they know who I am. But it is weird, like, getting recognized at the light rail station, like, oh, hey, Ritz, and I'm like, oh, hi. <laughs> I've done a lot of really cool ones. This dino that I just finished is probably one of my favorite ones I've ever done. He's really cool, like, I got to test out my new leg shape pattern and I got to make this big long tail that sticks out. He's got like LEDs and everything in the eyes and he's, he's just awesome. At this con, I had the made for you photo shoot. Oh, I'd expect maybe like 50 people to show up, but I had like 115 people come. This isn't even like half of what I've done. And they were all thanking me. No one would believe me and my real family about this. Oh, I spent an hour hanging out with 115 of my clients from Australia to New Zealand, Canada, Mexico, UK. And to me, that meant the world. The highest praise ever is when someone chooses me to create something for them. Um, hi, my name is Yvette Flores Rivera. I'm from Mexico. My free name is Etevi. I'm a rainbow wolf. I have other personas, but my main persona is a rainbow wolf named Etevi. Since I was a kid, I had like a character, which was a wolf. I always dreamed about being a wolf and doing like wolf things and everything. It took me like two years to just say to the world, I'm a furry and I don't care what, to, what you say, I'm a furry and I make forsets and I'm fun and I have fun with furry friends. All my family, all my friends, everybody knows I'm a forsetter, I'm a forset maker and I love animals and rainbows especially. <laughs> I grew up in a very small town in New Brunswick, in Canada. And I never really had anything to do inside. Like we didn't have many toys or access to TV or internet or anything like that. So I was always outside with my family and we were always exploring the woods and that kind of thing. And insects just happened to be the thing that I was like, oh, this is really cool. Today I'll be going through my field work here on the pumpkin patch. I hope you join me. I started to write journals about what I was seeing in the woods. I like would capture caterpillars and then I would like raise them into butterflies and I'd be on the playground, everybody's playing kickball or whatever, and I'd be on an ant mound like, hmm, this is really cool. That's when I was like, okay, I need to find the best place I can go in Canada to do this. Went away to the University of Guelph and that's how like the rest of my life started. An entomologist is a scientist and a biologist that studies insects specifically. So anything to do with insects, we like to fiddle with it. This is what my little field collection kit looks like. And so we're trying to collect as many ants as we can across these crops to see what they're doing. When I moved away for university, which was quite far, I moved half a country away to follow my passion. Didn't know anybody, I didn't know what to do. I had a lot of social anxiety, and so I just stayed in my room for the first three weeks. Didn't leave it, and so I just kind of was looking through the internet, found anthropomorphic animals, and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. Found for affinity, and I was like, oh, th this is really neat. There's a whole community of people that like animals this much. I ended up searching for insect photos most of the time, actually, and was like helping people by IDing photos like on for affinity, which is, Kind of weird and not really how many people use that website. I'm kind of known as the bug guy in the furry fandom. Every day I get like two or three messages from people like, whoa, what's this bug I found? <laughs> and I started to message people and get to know the community and find out more about it. 
I guess in USA it's more known for if fandom because if I put on my head in any place I want to take a picture, like a, a landscape or something, um, I, I have met people that just um, scream like, oh, for is. In Mexico, it's starting to, to be get known, but in USA it's very amazing because you can kind of be free being a furry and not having many people judge you more than in Mexico. I am a guy from uh, Mexico City. Born there, grew up in Texas, came back to Mexico City when I got invited to the first uh, furry meet in uh, Mexico City. Uh, it was around 100 people uh, that get together in a karaoke for the Friday night. And the next day we went to a museum all together. And it was like awkward because I just have a fox head with a paws. Everyone was looked at me because I took a public transport with a head like, oh my God, <laughs> I, love, I love to travel. I would say Taiwan was one of my favorite trips. I went to the convention in uh, Taiwan. The food, the food there was good, but was a completely different uh, challenge to try. And I tried almost everything. Another one, making a road trip from uh, Europe, France, and Germany to Denmark, Finland, Sweden, and uh, Norway again. Coming from Mexico, being a furry in Forcer in Mexico, it's in some parts, it's, it's actually very hard because people over there are very close-minded. In Mexico City, they are more open, like uh, they don't care much about what are you doing. But in the little towns and other cities of Mexico, it's like kind of, oh my God, there is where people were in a custom. People there are more like straightforward and they like touch you and poke your nose and grab stuff. So you have to have a handler. <laughs> But in Mexico City and Guadalajara and Monterrey, there are the three biggest cities, uh, people are open. When they see that there's nothing wrong, they actually throw you the kids. When they have, have kids, they go and take pictures with you. Yeah. Can you please hang my baby and, and take a picture? And I'm like, what? <laughs> no, no babies. People love it. I always have fun crossing the border, driving to USA to for conventions and bringing all my forces and stuff. When getting to the borderline, telling the officers where I'm going and what's up with all these costumes I have in the back. Most of the times the officers take the forces and, and, and sometimes they even put it put them on and it's like, oh, look, I'm I'm a wolf and anything. And they put on the hands and like, wow. <laughs> You are a bed, okay. Which one is yours? <laughs> yeah, I'm the removal. Oh, cool. Oh. <laughs> Being a furry, in some ways, it warms the heart of people because, well, they, they mostly are just like doing their job and all the days and seeing people. But when they see like colorful plushes, it's like, wow, what's this? Can I know more? I got one that told me that he wanted to go to a convention. I wish more people could be furry. I wouldn't have even known about the fandom if I didn't do YouTube. I was always involved in online communities with guys who unfortunately didn't see furries in the best light. Let's talk about furries. Welcome to another episode of Why Does This Exist? These are grown people dressing up as animals doing things that is not normal. One day, in a sort of cynical sense, I made the video the Seven Levels of Being a Furry, Dante's Edition. I'm not exactly proud of the standpoints that I took in that video. 
being a furry because there's nothing more unholy than a furry. The further down you go, the more from there, YouTube, I don't know what happened. It got into the search engines, got recommended, and all of a sudden the fandom was like right at my doorstep. The fandom came to me in some sense and introduced me to what it had to offer. What I had found in the fandom was something I had been looking for for years. A group of like friends that liked me for me. When everyone was coming and being like, do you know Majira Strawberry? I'm like, who is this person? Ever since I was young, I've always wanted to be a YouTuber. Filmmaking has always been something I'm very passionate about. I was browsing YouTube one day and I saw a Majira video. I just thought it would be something kind of fun to do and to try to do it myself. Well, this video, I'm gonna be trying to give answers to these questions. I was going through a divorce. Uh, the army was kicking me pretty hard in the butt. I needed somewhere to vent. A couple of my friends who I met through Vine ended up pushing me into YouTube, and that's where I started doing YouTube. Ah! Oh yes, my god. Yes. I want to make more videos in general and I bought a camera for kayaking, for skiing, and for furry. No microphone, no nothing, and it was very terrible. I didn't even have a tripod, so I was literally using uh, books to hold my phone up on my cat's, cat's cat tree. And that's why you can't find those videos anymore, because they're really crappy. <laughs> The fandom's sort of my life now. Like, all of my friends are furries. My job is a furry YouTuber, so it's even my job. It influences everything in my life. My furry stuff started to get a lot of traction. I decided to just jump in and try some new stuff. And it kind of spiraled from there. And it just kind of took off from there. I didn't want to be outed like However, some other way. When it comes and to have to have a conversation that. Well, I had to have my mind I told my parents I well. Furry YouTube is very heavily responsible for the growth of the, of the furry fandom within the last few years. Like furry Vine before Vine went away and even and more recently furry TikTok. Things like that are putting furry on an even bigger platform that exposes furry to who knows how many people. <laughs> My name is Beagle. I'm a graduate of UW-Madison where I studied English. My involvement in the fandom began with a lot of literature and writing and ended up in YouTubing. YouTube started out as just kind of like a fun little thing. I wanted to just like record all the fun stuff that happens at conventions and put it out for other people to see because that was how I found the furry fandom. And eventually it just kind of grew and grew until people started knowing me as a YouTuber. On one hand, Yes, furry YouTube impacts the fandom. It's exposing it to more people. But on the other paw, um, it's causing big growth with conventions and it makes it harder to get to hotels and it makes it harder to get the artists you like and stuff like that. So it, it really depends how you look at it. Even myself, I started off like what, a year ago? And it grew up way more than I expected. And I was like questioning myself, why do people enjoy what I do? And it's kind of weird and great at the same time because, hey, you're making stuff that people enjoy. But in return, it's almost like a glass cannon in a way where you kind of have to be careful of like what's done or what's said or who is involved necessarily. One small like negative action that's taken out of context can kind of ruin all that, unfortunately. Uh, I ran into some small drama myself recently. The video that I did, there was a lap dance. And to me, it seems kind of absurd that people are like being kind of judgmental. There is way more like sexualized stuff in just a normal pop music video from your favorite artists. In the end, people are people. Adults are adults. Some people try to push that under the rug, but the worst thing you could do is actually try to create a fake image 
because it is a thing, it always will be, and there's nothing wrong with that. I kind of found myself very narrow in what I was able to do and who I was able to go to and who I was able to trust. My community, who I was with before, had unfortunately turned their back on me. I didn't really have anyone. During that time in my life, I was very suicidal and depressed, and I'm willing to admit that now. A lot of the communities outside of the fandom don't really like to get involved with feelings or emotions, especially in the form of depression or suicide. A lot of people like to put that to the side or pretend it's not real, unfortunately. Even with my fraternity, a group of brothers that I had developed, you know, some of them don't exactly want to deal with that sort of thing. But with the fandom, you know, even some people that I barely met, they're like there for me. And they're like some of my best friends now. Like we had like only met for an hour and then I'm like opening up to them and then like they're opening up to me and it's like, how did this happen? I feel like we're so together and we interact with each other and we help each other a lot. I wouldn't be able to do what I do like with YouTube without the support of my friends who will do things like help me film something or make a cameo in a video or anything like that. We all care about each other and we want each other to be successful. With anxiety, like confronting it is the absolute best way I find to overcome it over time and get better. Doing furry YouTube it helps me with my own anxiety. So I'd really like to think it has a really good impact on people. I was originally gonna go back after the military and go work at the same job that my dad was working at and YouTube helped me realize that I have a lot more skills than what I thought originally. To be able to say, hey, I wanna do this. I hope you guys love it. If I could go back and explain to myself at the beginning of like this year and told me about everything I had done, everything that I had achieved, all the friends that I had made, I would have thought I was crazy. I went from like such a low point to such a high point, all because of the fandom. Put it simply, the furry fandom is a group of people with a similar interest in colorful cartoon animals. This idea of a fandom highlights a sense of community for people to find and befriend others in a safe environment. From the sense of community, and similarly to other The thing about furry is that it can be anything to anybody. There's so many definitions for what it can be to somebody. And that just attracts such a wide breadth of people to the point where it feels like such an interesting, fascinating melting pod. I didn't initially join though. There was like a period in my life where I discovered furries. I was like, okay, I like talking animal people, sure. People get like bullied a lot for being a part of this community and I grew up already like that so I was like oh I don't want to associate myself with another group that'll get bullied so mm. and then later on I'm like a lot of my friends were furry so I'm like fine I'll do it. <laughs> I knew that there was something like different about me at a very young age when I was like 12, 13 I started to like realize my interest in you know not straight things I guess but I always kind of pushed it away. I'm, I come from a very small southern town. Me being bisexual, I, I was really scared to even mention it to my parents. My sister, God bless her, um, was bisexual. One time she brought a girl home, and it was this whole thing, so it taught me to not bring a guy home. I learned what not to talk about with my family. And when I was 15 years old, my mom told me directly to not be bisexual after my sister came out as bisexual. Well... I'm gonna get married at the age of 19 and I'm gonna set my life up for the rest of it and stay in the military for 20 years. And yeah, I realized very quickly that that's not what I wanted. There was so much of my life that I wanted to experience, but I couldn't because I trapped myself in at a very early age with a situation that I wasn't comfortable with. Being in the fandom, the community is so positive with LGBT and all that kind of stuff. That helped me a lot because it gave me a place to be myself and to do what I like to do. 
The furry fandom has really pushed me into a much more stable lifestyle than I ever expected. And it's really changed me in both an emotional stability aspect as well as just being more open with my own self. That helped me build the confidence to tell my parents at age 22 that I'm gay. If something were to go wrong, I have my friends in the fandom to support me and be there for me. It allowed me to not be scared anymore. It's very interesting being a female creator in the fandom because so much of the fandom is made up of gay men, frankly, LGBTQ individuals. Overall, it's been great, but you do have some instances of misogyny. There's more meetings for only male people. And when you are being, you, you get in those meetings, sometimes they reject you. Sometimes you have to act a little bit more male-ish to be accepted in their male congregations. It sounds kind of bad and hard, but it's true. Select few men go, ew, girls are gross, yuck, I don't want anything to do with them. And I've actually had people at conventions like approach my table and go, oh, I didn't know that you were a girl. Like, I wanted to buy from you, but like... I'm still making the same art that you liked. Why does my gender matter? But overall, it's very positive. And being a forced maker female is very interesting because, like in Mexico, we even took a picture of only female forced makers and it was only one male. <laughs> and it was like 10 females. Females are... We, we are invading the world. <laughs> Whoa. When you think of big companies, it's always guys running them, but in the fandom, it's a lot of females doing the running of everything, which is a really nice change of pace. This community definitely made me more comfortable with myself. Like, it's because of this community that I understood that I wasn't, you know, like, you know, straight, for example. Oh, actually, it's really weird. This community not also helped me realize I was gay and also not entirely gay. It was very strange. Oh, like, I'm not entirely straight. And, like, I appreciated that. But then, like, at the same time, like, years and years later, like, I never actually, like, been a woman and like I didn't really feel comfortable like trying to confirm if I was entirely gay or not and let but this community feels so accepting that like I felt a lot more comfortable exploring that side and so I've just realized over time that sexuality is fluid in a spectrum at least in my opinion and I don't if I didn't have this community I don't think I might have been able to figure that out so I appreciate it for that Of course, we have our schemas or ideas of what like it means to be male or female, masculine or feminine. When I first joined the fandom and I started to discover my sexuality, it was the art that I was getting was a great avenue to explore that. I like made a character that I found represented me so well, and started doing art which is like gender bent. Oh, I did this fun thing, what do you think about this? And then people are like, oh yeah, that, that's really cute and that looks like you still kind of thing. And it's still you or it's more like you or something like that. And then to get art with friends and that kind of thing, you post the art and then there's a bunch of comments that are like, oh, this is hot, this is great. And then you feel good about that and you're like, yeah, okay, like the way I've been feeling for the longest time is okay and it's okay to be like that and it feels good to be that person. And there's these people that are there to back me up. And then it just allows you to explore more and be more true to yourself in a lot of ways. So I identify as non-binary and go by they or them. It's tightly linked to all aspects of who I am. My passion was always science and science intrinsically is just 
non-binary. Discipline of atmospheric science. One of the key aspects of the diversity of this group is use. I want to test how colonies react to various pesticides. In fact, from 1960, there was this big queer and science movement that happened. It's called 500 in STEM. And they wanted people to share their stories about them coming out and being okay in the scientific community. And I took that opportunity to write a little bio about me and my advisor saw it. He sent me an email and was like, I completely support you with this. I shared the email on my furry Twitter and it blew up. Like there was so many people that saw it. Somehow my department ended up finding it, retweeting it. We're happy to have students that are like this in our department. It was phenomenal. And that kind of confidence, I wouldn't have been able to do that without furry and all that backing that I had, especially on the internet. You have this big community of people that are so supportive on a digital media that you can access all the time. For some people I've noticed when People, I'm sure people who are watching this, I'm probably not the first person I've ever seen talk about this kind of thing. Like a common trope in furry interviews, like, oh, I'm very angry and shy, but the community like helps me come alive when I wear this fursuit, for example. I don't feel like fursuiting makes me less shy. I think it makes me more socially introverted because I find it harder to communicate with a suit on. Whereas with drag, I, that's when I really come alive because like I feel like I'm somebody else. I can be like the sassy person. The funny thing about drag and me is that I actually became a drag queen because of this community. Because I had a friend named Quick who wanted to do a music video for David Guetta's Worth and Girls at. And I was like, I want to be Nicki Minaj. I had never done anything like that, but I just, I just like wanted to embody them. Like even growing up, I would like see anime. I was like, oh, I love when they have their hair and bangs and stuff and it's all feminine. Like, I wish I could be like that. Because like as a nine-year-old, you don't realize you can do that. <laughs> and so I stuck with it and kept building. Now I am this monster that I am today with my name on my hat. I didn't make this, but I like it. <laughs> Drag can mean a lot of things, but it more or less encompasses just gender expression. And I think it's just nice to explore that entire spectrum. There's really no reason to just like restrict yourself unless you really want to. But like, <laughs> I personally enjoy getting to be both masculine and feminine and just not putting myself in one box. Everyone worries about the future of everything. If the furry fandom's gonna stay or if it's gonna die. We thrive off of creativity, just raw creativity. And we started from just a thought, just an idea, and then we built on that. You can't explain it, you have to live it. I always try to explain the furry fandom to all my close friends and actually have turned many people to furry. And honestly, I can name how many friends outside of the fandom I have on this one paw. All my friends are furry. It's so easy to interact with this community and it's everybody's so nice and kind and caring. You get to be confident, do whatever you want, climb out of your shell. I became this kind of person who I never thought I would be, and it actually makes me feel good inside. By chance, um, I met my best friend because she commissioned me for a badge, and then we started talking. Like, not everything we do revolves around furries, but it was a gateway for us to meet, and all the best people I know in my life, you know, come from that. So what can we do better as a community? Oh. Uh. Well, that's a very loaded question. Um, <laughs> you know, every group has its own things that make them bad, right? Seeing the fandom the first time, I was very surprised at, like, how very quick to judge people are sometimes. Something we need to improve on is to bully less. 
because negativity travels so fast. And I know that's not just a thing in the fandom, that's a thing everywhere. But I'd really like to see spreading positive things more. The suitor with the large belly, Zilasani, was getting like bullied so much just because their fursuit was different and people didn't like that. To see people on Twitter just like tearing the suitor apart, it, it sucks. When I got my new Majira fursuit, every single comment was like, your old suit was better, this suit was ugly, it's awful, and like that hurt me. But what hurt me more was what it did to my maker. It broke her heart to see people hating on the suit so much. She felt like she did such a bad job. And I kept saying, like, I love the suit, it's beautiful, it's just people need to get used to it. I wish people would just be more caring and open-minded about that kind of stuff. We are currently wrestling with the idea of trying to be accessible. We have many people who are prominent figureheads in furry who want to repress un unlikable or unsavory things to the public, like to maybe ignore the not safe for work qualities that happen. The polar opposite of the people who want absolutely anything to happen in furry with no accountability. So over policing versus zero policing whatsoever. I think both of these are going to be things that will dilute and eventually dissolve what furry is. In my opinion, we need to, as a whole, agree on what's most important to us. I think sometimes we do let certain things slide too much. Like, we are very not judgmental and accepting, but almost to a fault. It's, it's super safe, super accepting, very creative and awesome. But because it is so safe, it also harbors people that maybe weren't allowed elsewhere because of what they're doing or what they're thinking. Every community has their bad apples. Like, there's no community doesn't have like extremists or just like bad people in it like that's everywhere that's a constant we could do more probably to push those people out just because like it's nice to be accepting but at the same time you should only put up with so much a lot of people don't want to address the issue and many people are quick to write it off as oh that's just drama just ignore them they'll go away and i think if there was a better attitude about the fact that forgiveness is earned not just given out and that you need to actually put in effort then I think we would see like a healthier community overall. This last biggest little furry convention, BLSC 2018, there was a girl that was bullied for having a very poor or not good looking fursuit. She was being bullied because her suit was ugly. As soon as people heard about this, they were like rushing, like, where is this girl? She's hanging out with us now. And then they found her, and then they just hung out with her and showed her, like, what it was actually about. Seeing that unfold, how the furry fandom reacted the way it did to that really warmed my heart. I do want to encourage people to be very welcoming to the younger kids in this community who are looking to join because they are going to actually be the future of this fandom. And I don't see the fandom dying any day soon. Every fandom has the ups and downs, the pulse, the beat. Encourage other people to keep creating and to keep going. Go do what you enjoy. If you enjoy fursuits, build one or buy one. If it's making art, go and do that. If it's making videos, do the videos. This circle of friends is something you can't describe. It's more like a family where people really look out for you and you feel loved. We love each other, we care about each other, and that's the most important thing with the fandom, in my heart, anyway. Yeah.